Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Kurt Wohler for Integrated Medicine Academy. I want to thank Great Plains Laboratory again for sponsoring these complimentary webinars. I thought what we'd do in this talk is look at the bacterial meta, uh, metabolite uh, section of the oat. Um, this is one of these areas that, I don't know, sometimes gets overlooked because we're paying so much attention to the fungal and yeast markers or the clostridium markers, the oxalate. So this won't be as technical uh, a webinar as some of my previous ones where we're diving deep into mitochondria or mycotoxin-induced toxicity in the mitochondria, but it will uh, be interesting uh, none the least. So for those of you who have not heard me lecture before, I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician since the late 90s, uh, starting in, in San Diego, California, which is where I'm from. And once I got into this field, uh, things really quickly progressed. I've done a lot of work in autism over the years. I work a lot with people with chronic and environmental induced health conditions from mold toxicity that can induce GI problems or autoimmune issues, neurological issues as well. I've done a lot of clinical education for Great Plains Laboratory uh, over the years. I'm not an employee of Great Plains Lab. I've just used their labs for many years and it was the one that developed their organic acid test training seminar as well. I'm also the co-founder and education director for my own online academy called Integrative Medicine Academy, where we have mastery courses in a wide variety of topics related to integrative medicine from autism to hormones, to candida, toxicity issues, functional medicine, et cetera. And I'm also co-founder and educational director for Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which is a membership website for healthcare practitioners who are wanting more one-on-one -on -one assistance in lab interpretation and case presentation, troubleshooting, et cetera. So there is a, a seminar coming up um, on March 25th through the 27th, 2022, and this is online, I'll be actually teaching the organic acid test section of that conference. It's an all-day uh, uh, seminar on the implementation of the organic acid test, and it really gets into the fundamental aspects of the oat, which markers are most common, how to correlate cer certain sections of the organic acid test, and then there'll be other discussions on mold and toxins throughout the weekend. So check that out uh, in contact Great Plains uh, directly. Uh, you can also find information off their homepage about this conference. So the organic acid test is a very interesting test. It's really more of a profile because you could break down the different sections of this profile into these different tests. And so let's take a look at the bacterial markers. So I want to focus kind of in reverse order. We're going to start with DHPPA. And you, as you can see in this particular case, we've got somebody who has a lot of fungal markers. They've got one clostridium marker, but they have quite a few bacterial markers as well showing up on this particular section. So DHPPA stands for 3,4-dihydroxyphenylpropionic acid. Now this is the propionic acid side group, as we can see coming off here. And then we've got a hydroxyl group coming off this benzene ring, so at position three and four. So that's our three, four di, so that there's two of those. Hydroxy, that's two of these hydroxyl groups here. And then we have our Phenyl. So anytime we attach a hydroxy group to a benzene ring, it's a phenol. So 3,4-dihydroxyphenol or phenyl propionic acid. So that's how the, the name is established. So this particular chemical is actually a marker for beneficial bacteria in the digestive system. So that it could be produced because of the presence of lactobacillus, E. coli, bifidobacter. There is a clostridia bacteria and the presence of it can uh, cause this elevation as well, uh, this particular clostridia here. Um, and I think what ends up happening is that certain things that we eat, so celery or parsley or other herbs, um, these flavonoids essentially get converted 
um, into DHPPA. So DHPPA in, in most cases is reflection of the presence of these types of bacteria. Now, there is a chemical called chlorogenic acid, which we'll come back to here shortly. So there's actually a lot of upside to DHPPA. And this actually comes from PubMed and as well as the National Library of Medicine, the NIH. It turns out that DHPPA is an antioxidant and it can help reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines. It likely also helps protect against various pathogenic bacteria. Now, it's interesting, you start doing a little bit of research into this, and this is just a research article I came across. Now, this was in mice, but they were looking at, again, 3,4-dihydroxyphenyl propionic acid, and they were looking specifically at how it influenced hepatic injury, liver injury uh, from ischemia, because what it was doing is it was mitigating the effects of certain macrophage activity on pro-inflammatory cytokine production. So here we've got a couple pro-inflammatory cytokines. We've got tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6, which in an elevated state in a liver injury could just drive inflammation. And then there's this chemical here called CXCL2, chemokine ligand 2, which is actually a pro-inflammatory macrophage attractor. So basically these pro-inflammatory chemicals getting triggered because of this chemical called HDAC, which is what's called a histone deacetylase reaction. And there's different types of deacetylase enzymes. And what these enzymes do is they regulate the acetyl groups on lysine, amino acid lysine, which is part of histones. Now histones uh, help protect DNA from getting damaged or being overexpressed or being part of what's called transcription factor activity. So the way you could think of a histone is you're taking a bunch of uh, chromosomes, your DNA strands essentially and bundling them up so that they're not recognizable for transcription. So what the DHPPA does is it helps to short circuit that enzymatic reaction, that histone deacetylase. And this, again, there's a bunch of different histone deacetylases. This is a group of enzymes. In this particular case, they were looking at histone deacetylase one, which would increase its activity, which could then cause increased transcription factor activity, generating the production of tumor necrosis factor in leukin six, for example, and causing an, a pro-inflammatory effect in the liver. So basically the DHPPA helping to thwart that problem. Okay, so that's DHPPA. Now let's go back to the beginning of the test under the bacterial markers and look at hyperic. So in the vast majority of cases, hyperic acid is produced again because of the conversion of something called chlorogenic acid, which is a substance found in many different types of foods, fruits, vegetables, for example. And it gets converted into hyperic acid. So hyperic acid is a conjugate. That's basically joining of two or more chemical compounds. So in this particular case, we're joining benzoic acid with the amino acid glycine to form hyperic acid. So essentially glycine gets attached or part of what's called a conjugation reaction on benzoic acid. We'll, we'll look at caffeic acid as well as chlorogenic acid here shortly. So benzoic acid is a metabolite of phenylalanine. And it turns out that hyperic acid appears to have some antifungal properties, and it's also used as a food preservative. In most cases, it's figured that hyperic acid is really being produced, again, because of the presence of intestinal bacteria that are taking chlorogenic acid, converting it to benzoic acid, and then glycine gets attached to make hyperic acid, and then it's being excreted in the urine. 
So the interaction of glycine within the liver takes place in phase two liver detoxification under these amino acid conjugation reactions. So glycine essentially acting as a conjugate or taking part in a conjugation reaction. We've, we've heard a lot about glutathione conjugation where glutathione gets attached to a toxin and rendering it less toxic. Well, the same kinds of things are happening with these other amino acids. So in this, this was actually a paper that was looking at these types of chemical reactions. So here is our phenylalanine, as you can see. We can see in this particular case, it gets converted into cinnamate, into benzaldehyde, into benzoic acid. And then through bacterial fermentation processes, it gets converted into hyperic acid. So that's the key bacterial, the presence of those bacteria um, are helping to convert benzoic acid into hyperic acid. So in most cases, it is a reflection of increased bacterial activity or presence in the digestive system. So causes of high hyperic. Okay, so generally elevated hyperic is an indicator of bacterial growth in the intestines. Now, for most individuals, this situation can be handled simply with some probiotics. Okay, just nothing more than that. We could always use some antibacterial botanicals, for example, very rarely, and that would have to be really defined because of the clinical presentation of your patient with antibiotics. So the vast majority of people will do fine with either just multi-strain probiotics or maybe the addition of a botanical. Now let's take a look at chlorogenic acid. So chlorogenic acid, as was mentioned before, is found in many different types of foods. In fact, many healthy foods that most of us would be eating or should be eating on a good plant-based diet. So apples, blueberries, carrots, cherries, you know, peaches, for example. Tea is an interesting source of chlorogenic acid. And then benzoic acid can actually be found in things like cranberries and cranberry juice. So again, chlorogenic acid gets converted to caffeic. It also could be produced into quinic acid. Both end at benzoic acid, which gets converted into hyperic acid by the attachment of a glycine amino acid. So T polyphenols, right, get into our small intestine. They get absorbed. And then in the liver, they get conjugated in this particular case with, if it's benzoic acid with glycine, for example. Um, and then we got benzoic that becomes hyperic, which can be expressed in the kidneys through the urine. So we're coming out in the urine. Or it can get essentially reabsorbed and then dumped in the bile into the intestinal tract. Um, and then these phenolic acids get reabsorbed back into the liver and come out as hyperic acid. So a number of ways that our body deals with these things, but a lot of it comes again because of the microorganisms in the digestive tract. All right, so chlorogenic acid to caffeic acid to benzoic acid to hyperic acid. That's a key component right there is that benzoic acid because right here is where that glycine is being attached. So let's look at caffeic acid and benzoic acid in a, a very important aspect, I think in all of our health, particularly our patients as well, but us as human beings too, in that the existence of these compounds, so benzoic acid, caffeic acid, something called 3-phenylpropionic acid, even chlorogenic acid work in unison to enhance anti-colon cancer activities. So these metabolites of these compounds that come from our food that are acted upon and converted in different steps by the bacteria in our digestive tract have an anti-colon cancer effect. And so this is one of those, I think, sort of visual representations of why eating a healthy diet, plant-based diet, can help reduce colon cancer risk. Okay. 
One of the other interesting things too about these aromatic amino acids, that would be tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine. In this particular case, we've been talking about phenylalanine is that the way our gut microbiome works on these amino acids and the communication networks that our microbiome has on many other aspects of our body seem to play a positive role in our immune system, on our metabolic system, even within the nervous system. So again, when you actually start diving into the microbiome and some of the beneficial effects of it, it's pretty amazing at how many different biochemical systems that it interacts with. We know that disturbances of the microbiome can have an adverse effect. It's not just happening in the digestive tract, right? Toxins that are being generated within the digestive tract can find their way into the brain. So for example, we can get chemicals that get dumped into circulation and can cross through the blood brain barrier. We can also get toxins that get produced within the gut and may find their way directly into the brain through the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve acts as a portal, if you will. This I have some information on this in one of the lectures I do in the organic acid test seminar that shows clostridia toxins look like they can gain access to the brain through the vagus nerve. And so clearly disruptions in the microbiome can lead to brain disturbances, depression, anxiety, other types of problems. Well, the same kind of things then from a healthy microbiome status could prevent against some of these things from occurring as well. So obviously the gut plays a huge role in our health, in our physiology and our biochemistry. Um, it's a whole other area obviously that, that can be looked at with, with research and, and insight to try to find some of the correlating patterns. Coffee um, actually has some properties that can generate hyperic acid. So these phenolic compounds in coffee, like chlorogenic acid, again, can have a beneficial effect on the gut flora and in some degree may have some anti-colon cancer properties as well. Now, one of the other things that has been associated with hyperic acid is exposure to toluene. So toluene is a, a chemical that is used in many different things from a processing standpoint, from gasoline to crude oil to coal. It's also used or seen in paints and paint thinners and fingernail polish and adhesives, rubber, for example. And so here is the chemical structure of toluene. So we have a benzene ring with a methyl group or what would be called a methyl toluene. And then this gets converted to benzyl alcohol into benzaldehyde into benzoic acid, which eventually gets converted into hyperic acid. So it is possible that the presence of hyperic acid could be linked to toluene exposure. This was a paper that came out back in 2013 that was looking at individuals who had high exposure to paint um, at a steel manufacturing um, company and found that was very most likely linked to sort of high persistent exposure to toluene. And this is an important point when in any test that we do, organic acid test or a GPL tox profile or a mycotox profile or any test really, is that we need to do a good clinical intake. Right? Are we working with somebody who's working around paints or adhesives or other glues or other types of things where the exposure source might be higher than sort of just the common everyday person? Because there can be, in certain circumstances, the hyperic may be associated with toluene exposure, but that by and large is not going to account for the vast majority of people that we would typically see in our practice. Um, it's really felt, you know, you know, from Great Plains' perspective, that the bulk of people that we're seeing with high hyperic is really coming from a bacterial source, not so much a high toluene source. 
Now, you could always do a GPL tox profile. One of the chemicals on the GPL tox profile is benzene. Okay, so remember, the toluenes have benzene as its aromatic ring structure. So basically, a, a toluene is just adding a methyl group off of one end of the benzene. In my experience, benzene or the metabolite of benzene seen on the GPL tox profile is not elevated all that often. So, you know, the chances are in the vast majority of people that hyperic is coming from a bacterial food metabolite source in the gut and not from a benzene exposure source or a toluene exposure source. But that could be something that you could investigate in your practice, okay? If you're seeing high levels of hyperic, you know, get a history from people. What, what are they exposed to? What kind of profession are they in? Is there a potential that it might be a toluene sport source? And you can always do a GPL tox profile and see if the benzene metabolite is high. I think if you do that, by and large, you'll find that it's not very common. Well, what about... 2-hydroxyphenylacetic. 2-hydroxyphenylacetic is associated again with intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These markers aren't telling us what kind of bacteria would be generating these things. It could be multiple types of bacteria. It also turns out that 2-hydroxyphenylacetic could be elevated in a condition called phenylcutinaria which is a condition that is mostly occurring in kids, they figure about one in 10,000 births in children will have PKU or phenylcutinaria. So here is our phenylalanine and here is our phenylacetic acid. Okay, so this is always a possibility, but you have to determine as a practitioner what is the likelihood that this one marker on an organic acid test under the bacterial marker section is going to be linked to phenylketonuria? Okay, particularly in an adult. Um, and you'd have to go actually look up some of the symptoms of phenylketonuria because they can be very extreme and very devastating for a newborn. So by and large, what we're looking at in the vast majority of people is again a bacterial overgrowth converting phenylalanine into phenylacetic acid. But to take this just one step further to give you some perspective is that phenylketonuria is a condition where we, we don't convert phenylalanine into tyrosine. So there is a defect in the enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. And again, that occurs in about one in 10,000 births. And it could be a very, devastating um, neurological condition. It is interesting though, just as a side note, is that the mycotoxin called ochratoxin A is a phenylalanine hydroxylase inhibitor. Okay, so if we get a blockage of phenylalanine hydroxylase, we can get a buildup of phenylalanine, too much of it's toxic in the brain, and we get a buildup of phenylpyruvic acid and phenylacetic acid and phenylactic acid. So in this particular case, the 2-hydroxyphenylacetic might be associated with a PK or a, phenyl, a phenylalanine inhibition. But in those particular cases, you're also gonna see high levels of phenylpyruvic acid and high levels of phenylactic acid seen on the organic acid test under the amino acid metabolites on the last page which are linked more strongly to those inborn errors of metabolism. So think of percentages, what's the most likely reason that this marker is elevated? Again, it goes back to the fact that the greater percentage, the greater chance is it's coming from bacterial overgrowth. That's why it's in this section of the test. Now we get into this discussion in much greater detail in a course that we have through our Integrative Medicine Academy called the Advanced Oat Mastery Course. And this course goes to every single marker on the organic acid test, including all the yeast and fungal markers, the bacterial markers, clostridia, 
every single marker in a very detailed way. And we do get into talking about PKU and some of the other things that can manipulate those enzymes that would lead to some of those rare uh, genetic inborn errors in metabolism. This course is very appropriate if you have some uh, use or training in the organic acid test, if you've actually been through a GPL Academy event, or if you're going through and taking the one coming up here in a couple of weeks, um, we have a new course starting of the advanced oat um, happening here at the end of the month. So any information, you go to advancedoatmasterycourse.com. 4-hydroxybenzoic, 4-hydroxyhyperic. Now, again, these come under, right, the, the bacterial metabolite section of the oat. So by and large, it's felt that these are coming again because of intestinal dysbiosis. It is always possible that somebody may be exposed to parabens. So parabens are chemicals that are used as preservatives uh, in certain foods, certain cosmetics, for example. So that is something that could be discussed with your patient if these are high. But again, there's a reason they list these things under the bacteria section is because it's felt that they more likely come from a bacterial source. So the most common uh, to be associated with is the bacterial overgrowth in the digestive tract. You know, they can be metabolites of parabens. We know that parabens have estrogenic activity. You know, they could be associated with things like breast cancer, for example. And some of the toxicities of parabens is that they can damage the mitochondria. Um, specifically the electron transport chain that can lead to a decrease of ATP production. Okay, so these things unfortunately are widely used in cosmetic products, in foods, as preservatives. And so parabens get broken down into a form of benzoic acid Okay, and so it basically gets expressed as 4-hydroxybenzoic acid or 4-hydroxyhyperic acid. Similar chemicals to what was shown uh, with hyperic acid, the first marker under the bacterial section of the oat. So these actually have a similarity, again, to benzoic and hyperic acid. It just depends on further uh, assimilation of the hydroxy group on the benzene ring. Okay, so an interesting website, just as a side note, Environmental Working Group is a, a good resource for patients where you can get all kinds of information about safe products to use from a, com a cosmetic standpoint. They all actually have great information here on different types of water filters for you know, purifying water and a lot of other information here about environmental chemical exposure uh, and products that people can access to decrease their exposure potential. So what are we looking at? What are we looking at under the bacterial marker section? Okay, essentially we're looking at bacterial dysbiosis most likely. We do know that DHPPA is linked to beneficial bacteria. So this actually has a lot of positive upside. We know that hyperic is occurring because most, in most cases, the chlorogenic acid being converted to benzoic acid being converted to hyperic acid. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Not really. It's showing us that at least maybe our patients, you know, um, eating many of those foods, although in elevated state, is going to point us towards that we likely are dealing with some kind of dysbiosis, just an overgrowth or overexpression of certain bacteria. It does not define pathogens. Okay, in order to define pathogens, we'd have to actually do stool testing to try to identify if there are any specific bacterial pathogens, as opposed to just a dysbiosis scenario of different commensal bacteria. Now, under the Clostridia bacterial marker section of the oat, these toxins are linked to pathogens. So 4-hydroxyphenylacetic, 
HPHBA for creosol, for example. It certainly is possible in this particular scenario that we have dysbiosis that is also being contributed or exacerbated because of the presence of Clostridia bacteria. But by and large, when we're looking at this section of the oat, right, we're looking at things that in most circumstances could be dealt with through probiotics or even just the use of bacterial uh, botanicals or antibacterial botanicals. Now, let me just step aside real quick and let's just take a quick look at this 4-hydroxyphenyl acetic acid marker. And I realize this isn't part of the bacterial sections, it's part of the clostridia section. And there's not a lot of information out there. This actually comes from one of my lectures too, but it's interesting. This was an article that came out way back in the late 70s that looked at 4-hydroxyphenyl acetic acid being associated with small bowel disease. Now that could also mean small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so the question is, is in a, any given patient, when we see elevations of 4-hydroxyphenyl acetic, or we see elevated levels of some of these bacterial markers, is this diagnostic of SIBO? Well, in my opinion, it's not, because you actually have to correlate that information to the clinical presentation of your patient. And we really can't use the organic acid, at least in classic terms, to diagnose SIBO because it's not measuring hydrogen, methane, or hydrogen sulfide. We'd actually have to do a SIBO test for that. But for many years, ever before those SIBO breath tests ever came out, most you know, naturopathic doctors and you know, integrative doctors would essentially be treating people for a suspected SIBO or maybe even irritable bowel condition without ever doing testing. So we can certainly use the organic acid test to help point the way and then correlate the information to sort of the clinical presentation of the patient and our own clinical judgment of, is it likely we're dealing with SIBO or irritable bowel? Well, some of that you can just tease out through a clinical history. But what we definitely know in this particular circumstance is that we have dysbiosis. We've got a uh, imbalanced scenario happening within the digestive tract, could be small intestine, could be large intestine. We know that clostridia is mostly expressing its toxins in the large intestine. Who's to say that some of these markers coming from let's say for hydroxybenzoic or hyperic, for example, these might be coming from bacteria in the small intestine as well. And either way, by an overexpression of these bacteria, many of them normal bacteria, we get a production of gas that can lead to discomfort and bloating and pain and loose stool or constipation or sometimes both. But use the organic acid test as a guide. But if you're really wanting to get into SIBO, for example, and, and sort of feel like more comfortable in diagnosing that um, in the sort of, again, classical definition, you need to do the breath testing um, as a confirmation of that. Now, in my opinion, the organic acid test should always be done in anybody who's either been diagnosed with SIBO or suspected of having it, same thing with irritable bowel syndrome. So let's go through a couple examples here and, and look at stool testing as well as the bacterial markers. And that is, is can we use the bacterial marker section to automatically confirm that we've got a bacterial imbalance on a stool test? Well, this was a... Um, one particular example here, we've, clearly we can see we've got major dysbiosis. We've got a lot of clostridia bacteria, and we've got a number of elevated bacterial markers. So that clearly is a dysbiotic condition. But when we look at the stool analysis, we'll notice that there's nothing listed under the dysbiotic flora. We, we've got some commensal bacteria, and we've got low E. coli and lactobacillus. So there's clearly an imbalance happening here, particularly within the microbiome, but we do not have, by classic stool testing confirmation, a dysbiotic stool, although our organic acid test certainly points to that. 
In this particular case, we can see relatively, well, we've got a mixed pattern of beneficial flora. So we got one plus bifidobacter, one plus lactobacillus, nothing in the commensal area. And we've got a one, a four plus enterobacter. So that would certainly show up in as a dysbiotic flora and certainly uh, potentially pathogenic. But you'll notice that there's nothing really of significance. Some of these are trending a little bit high, but nothing elevated under the bacterial section. So in this particular case, you know, if you didn't do the stool, you wouldn't have picked up on the enterobacter. Another interesting, just sort of as a side note, notice we've got a three plus clostridia, but notice that none of the clostridia markers are elevated. So this clostridia is really no, most likely not a toxic forming clostridia. There's many clostridia that are actually beneficial to the digestive tract. So in this particular case, in looking at it, the organic acid test doesn't really show us a dysbiotic pattern. Now, maybe it's coming, right? Every test you do is a snapshot in time. What happens if we waited a month, two months, three months down the road? Well, maybe because of the existence of that enterobacter, if it wasn't treated, we could start to see an expression of these bacterial organic acids. Here's another scenario. Okay, we've got pretty good diversity in our microbiome. We've got a number of commensal bacteria, two plus strep, one plus staph, nothing in the dysbiotic section, but look at our bacterial section on the oat. Okay, this person's just loaded with imbalances. We do have a HPHPA that's high. So again, it's, it's not always gonna line up perfectly. Um, and so again, it comes back to using our clinical judgment, understanding what we're looking at um, and getting a good clinical history and deciding from there how to proceed with treatment. Notice there's no growth under the clostridia section of the stool test, but we have a positive HPHPA. This is one of the reasons why I feel stool testing for these clostridia toxins will just miss the problem, whereas the organic acid test more commonly picks it up, okay? And in this particular case, we notice we have a lot of commensal bacteria. We've got two dysbiotic bacteria, Citrobacter and Klebsiella, but for the most part, nothing is really being expressed at this point on the organic acid test under the bacterial marker section. So that doesn't mean it's not coming, right? It, it's certainly something that might show up down the road, but at least at, at the time that these tests were done, which were done relatively around the same time, the organic acid test was not really picking this up. Okay, so this was actually an interesting case. This is a, a couple of cases from my partner in practice. 43 year old uh, uh, female who had a lot of body pain and constipation. This was actually looking at a GI map. So we can see that there's a fair amount of bacteria, opportunistic bacteria, overgrowth of normal bacteria. Okay, but nothing really expressing on the organic acid test. In this particular case, actually, the main driving thing for all of this pain was eating a high oxalate diet. And I mean, a really high oxalate diet. Here we have an individual, a 66-year-old female with body pain as well. That should say pain, that's a typo. Body pain. And a lot of just sort of back and forth digestive issues, bloating, reflux. Um, we do see an elevation of DHPPA, which could be, come about because of just eating a healthy diet, which that person was attempting to do, and high hyperic. But we don't have any of the other metabolites showing up, okay? So the hyperic here, uh, these two things are likely more linked to just eating a lot of plant-based foods and likely because of just some of the dysbiotic pattern we're seeing off of the stool test. Here's a 59-year-old female with 
chronic loose stools and suspected uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And we can see a lot of elevations here on the GI map of various bacteria. And we've got a similar pattern to that previous one. We've got high hyperic and elevated DHPPA. Now this person also tended to eat a lot of vegetables as well. Um, so clearly there is some underlying imbalances here. And again, as I mentioned, there's a suspicion of inflammatory bowel disease that needed to be looked at. Now I've used this particular case in many of my talks within the various uh, organic acid test seminars that I've done. This actually comes from a, a three-year-old, he's three years old at the time, autistic child, who had a lot of behavioral problems, um, sky-high oxalates, some of the highest mycotoxins I've ever seen. I'm not going to show you that, that information, but what really struck me was the original test that we did showed definitely some dysbiosis, right? So we've got the 4-hydroxybenzoic is high, the 4-hydroxyhyperic, as well as a high hyperic. Now, we weren't able to do a stool test. This is a family uh, out of the country. But we did notice that three of the four clostridium markers were all very high. So clearly, there is dysbiosis plus clostridia toxicity. And as I mentioned, this, this kid also had really high oxalate mitochondrial problems, et cetera. So, a number of things were attempted from botanicals to dietary change. It was very difficult logistic wise in getting supplements to this family. And they actually went on um, a course of antibiotics primarily to address the clostridia problems. And the results were pretty dramatic. We didn't completely get rid of the 4-hydroxyphenylacetic, but there was a dramatic shift as you can see in the uh, bacterial marker section, although there's still some work to do, this 4-hydroxybenzoic is still elevated, but a major change in the clostridium markers. Now, I believe one of the interfering factors in this child's gut is the presence of mold and mycotoxins because they actually live in a home that had mold detected, aspergillus. He had huge levels of mycotoxins and, but he can't get out of the home. So we know that many of those mycotoxins will inhibit the immune function uh, and make it much more difficult to actually get rid of some of these bacterial problems in the digestive tract. He also had massively high numbers on some of the yeast and fungal sections of the oat. So we'll talk about this case more um, through, again, some of the organic acid test training that we have, including that upcoming um, Oat seminar through Great Plains. So as a recap, okay, most situations with high bacterial markers on the oat can be resolved with probiotics and or botanical remedies. DHPPA is commonly high. Um, it can be high with probiotic use, by the way. And it has actually many positive influences that we, as we mentioned. Hyperic might be linked to toluene exposure. But again, work the percentages, by and large, it's gonna be coming from increased bacterial activity and likely dysbiosis. 2-hydroxyphenylacetic is linked to bacterial dysbiosis. It could be linked to phenylketonuria, but that's not likely. 4-hydroxybenzoic, 4-hydroxyhyperic, may be from paraben exposure, but much more likely from bacterial dysbiosis as well. The other thing is, there's nothing wrong with doing stool testing. There's nothing wrong with doing oat testing and stool testing, but don't expect in every circumstance that the bacterial section on the stool is gonna match the bacterial section on the oat. Um, as you can see, in some of those cases I had, there were certainly some that correlated and some that didn't. That doesn't mean that the bacterial section on the oat isn't worthwhile or that the stool testing isn't worthwhile, or you know that one should be always be done, or you know versus the other. Um, every test we do is a different camera angle 
on something that we're trying to visualize. And the more information we could get sometimes helps to bring things together from a more three-dimensional standpoint. This is something that you can also look to do in your practice and start seeing if you can see correlations between the organic acid test, the bacterial marker section, and what you're picking up on, on a stool analysis. One thing for sure is that dysbiosis in the gut is not occurring by just from one thing. It's not just because of food sensitivities, for example, or heavy metals. It's usually a combination of factors that's leading to these imbalances. And so as we start to dig deeper into this, we've got to sort of start asking the questions, what are some other things that this person may be exposed to? What are some other things that they could do to try to improve the situation? And um, a lot of times that can lead us to other types of testing, other types of interventions. But if we were to look at it from a just a real straightforward standpoint, the bacterial marker section is certainly valuable to pick up on patterns of dysbiosis. And if we were just to, to treat it as a separate section, the vast majority of people are gonna get positive benefit either with probiotic use, and or a botanical uh, anti, you know, anti, uh, uh, antimicrobial botanical just to sort of knock back some of the op opportunistic bacteria that can accumulate in the digestive tract. And that could be really any kind of combination of botanical out there. Um, I use a lot of the biocide in my practice, but I know there are a lot of other combination botanicals that may be helpful too, and you might have your own favorite. So. Um, just kind of explore that as options. Now, as I mentioned before at the beginning of this talk, we actually have a membership website for healthcare practitioners. That could be if you're a nutritionist, if you're a health coach, if you're uh, an MD, a DO, a chiropractor, a naturopath, and you want to interact with us more directly, myself, Dr. Wohler, my partner, Dr. Trenkatella, you can actually join this website and set up one-on-one -on -one consults with us to go over lab testing, to look at clinical cases, to clinically troubleshoot. We also have a lot of educational material that um, is in this site as well, educational videos, downloads, et cetera. So for more information, go to functionalmedicineclinicalrounds.com. If you have any questions about many of our mastery courses through Integrated Medicine Academy, including the upcoming Advanced Oat Mastery course, you can always email us at integrativemedicineacademy at gmail.com. There's a website that provides access to certain laboratory testing, including Great Plains Laboratory, including the organic acid test and comprehensive digestive stool tests. Uh, for more information, you can go to labtestplus.com, look at the menu of tests that's available, or you can email labtestplus at gmail.com. And so if you came on late to this, webinar, I just want to remind everybody there is a organic acid test seminar coming up on March 25th that is linked to a three-day seminar through the uh, GPL Academy from Great Plains Lab that will also be looking at environmental toxins, mold, mycotoxins, and more. For more information, go to greatplainslaboratory.com uh, and reach out with any questions that you have. And finally, I am always available for private consultations through my practice, which is Sunrise Functional Medicine. There's my phone, our email, uh, as well as our website. Okay, well, thanks so much everybody for your attention. I appreciate it. I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler, take care.